Hey, Jason, welcome to the show, brother. Thanks for having me, Corey. Happy to be here. Awesome, awesome. Well, look, really excited about this story because it's one that's near and dear to my heart uh, in my mind is that everybody has a different way they get into real estate. And some people kind of go in kicking and screaming. Some people put one foot in, kind of you know, test the waters. And then some other people just go off to the high dive and just say, I'm coming, baby, and do a big old floppity flop in it and see what happens. And uh, I think you got a really unique story and I'll let everybody, all the listeners figure out which one you decided to choose. So uh, before we do that though, can you give us a little bit about yourself and your company? Uh, yeah, sure. So uh, my name is Jason Bake. I am a managing principal at Compounding Capital Group. We are a multifamily investment firm based out of Cincinnati, and we tend to take on value-add deals. So anything that we can inject some of our own human capital into it to provide uh, returns that are a little higher than you know traditional stabilized assets. Awesome, love it, love it. So let's hear, uh, you told me a little bit about how you got into real estate, but I would love to hear uh, the more of the detailed version of uh, how you got in this game. Uh, yeah, yeah, sure. So uh, I guess just to start at the beginning, I, I always was told or, or taught that there was one path to, to living a successful life, quote unquote. And it was to go to a decent school, get a decent job, put your head down, work every single day for, for the next 45 years and retire 65. And it wasn't until I, I was about a decade into that journey where I realized that it was kind of not what I wanted to do with my life. And uh, I've always heard that real estate was the vehicle that most people became millionaires. And knowing that I didn't really have a high need for a lot of money, uh, I figured that it was gonna be the most efficient way for me to get to a point where I, I just had time and financial freedom. And so uh, about two and a half years ago, I was a director of data in corporate America. I had been in data my entire life, I used to be a management consultant, and I decided to uh, quit my day job and just go into real estate full time when I had uh, absolutely no experience, had not even bought my own house, barely understood how houses held themselves together. But uh, I I knew a little bit about how I functioned best, and I figured I'd, I'd take a chance with myself for the first time. Wow. So just cold turkey up to the high dive. Let's jump off. Here we go, baby. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And as reckless as that seems on the surface, I did save money for three years so that I could have a little bit of a runway for myself. So I wouldn't have to worry about, you know, where my, my next meal came from. Or if so I could there was some strategy, some strategy there. But when you made the decision, and I think that's the key point is when you made the decision, you knew exactly what you were going to do. So there was maybe some planning behind it, but like the decision was made. Uh, exactly. And I'm a big planner. And, and it's funny because, uh, again, it sounds like I took a bold step in my life, which uh, in hindsight I did. But even after I saved the amount of money that I promised myself that I would save before I could make the jump, it took me another six months after that because it was just a, such a scary move in my life. Yeah. No, I listen. I always feel like people. So I never have seen anybody become super successful doing anything part time. Right. Never. And even for me, I when I first was doing real estate, I was doing it part time and I bought some single families and I was somewhat successful, but like not at any levels. Right. Mm -hmm. It was only until I actually for me, I was a little bit opposite. I got fired from a company. <laughs> so I had to make a choice what I was going to do next. And so there's two ways you can do it. One is you fire yourself uh, the correct way or you, uh, which no, the other one was my way, which uh, someone fired me and I, was, I better jump. I'm jumping out of the plane, whether I want to or not, I better build the parachute and figure out how I'm going to land this thing. That, that's funny you say that because I, I know that if I juggled two things, I would be terrible at both things. And I also didn't want to, you know, leave my corporate life behind on a bad note. So I figured if I didn't fire myself that I would also eventually get fired. So I, yeah. I kind of made that that choice preemptively. Yeah, it really is funny. And it, if you really look at successful people, you will see that, and a lot of them have these kind of journeys, right? Like, hey, I thought I was going to move in this direction, but it's really, there's a usually a pivotal moment in time where it's like, I know this to be true. I know this is where I need to go. And then you fully commit. And anybody that I've seen at a very high level, whether it's sports or athletes, 
or anything like that. Anybody that's been like, you look at Michael Jordan, right? He, I mean, you can look at all those guys. They all have the same trait. They got super focused on what they wanted to do, and then they went all in. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't surprise me much when you say that, hey, I did this, and then you were able to do X, Y, and Z because you premeditated that stuff. Yeah, it's all uh, slowly coming together day by day. Right. And it's a journey, right? Probably not where you want to be yet, but you still are are focusing on where you're going. Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. And uh, I mean, I have a little bit of traction today, and uh, the goal is to yeah, get a lot farther than I am right now. So how far, uh, how long, when did you really jump in? Is it how many years ago or, or, or is it recently or talk to me? Uh, two and a half years is when I uh, gave up that that corporate life and I okay. jumped immediately into single family homes. But uh, I was in single family homes for, for barely like a year before I decided multifamily was the, the direction I wanted to head. Okay. Yep. That sounds that's another common scenario, right? Mm-hmm. I yeah, was, yeah. I exactly. thought it was single family is the answer, but then you're like, yeah, it's not what I think it is, right? Mm-hmm. There's no long term wealth there, by the way. Right, right. And it's just like really hard to scale. Like I, I've always not, like I, my goal wasn't to spend the next 40 years picking up one single family home at a time. That's just another day job that I gave to myself. I wanted to get to financial and time freedom faster. And even just driving around from one address to the next when a single family homes takes time, it's inefficient. So multifamily seemed the, like the next logical step. Yeah, very logical for sure. And so um, and then how many units do you own now? Uh, about 350. Yeah, awesome. That's that's huge. How many complexes is that? Two, three, four, five, six, seven, I believe. Okay, so seven complexes. Now, so, and and by the way, this puts you in a very unique class. So every, I always like to follow up with that question because it shows the kind of strategy that you're using. Because some people, and a lot of people coming on these podcasts think that you have to buy these big 100 unit plus apartments, like, now that's what I buy, but like I, I believe there is a absolute way to buy, Jason. Probably what you're buying. Can you expand on what you're buying and what what that looks like? Uh yeah, yeah. Anything from let's say 25 to 150 units is is the range that we look for. Uh, we have stuff. I mean, even last year we bought something as as small as a as a 17 unit and as large as like a, a 65 80. Oh, sorry, a 65 70 unit. And so we're, we're, because we're looking for value add deals, we're also trying to buy them at a right price. And it's a lot easier to get like a mom and pop that owns a midsize apartment complex to absolutely to some sort of bargain. <laughs> absolutely. So that, and that's the key, right? So I'm telling you right now, guys, if you're listening, that is a honey hole of buying those mid level between 12 to, to 60 units, 70 units. You know, that's not the seasoned investor per se. That's some some mom and pop that owns those things. Mm-hmm. And um, they probably don't know exactly. You, they probably made some mistakes or they've not raised rents in a while. And so there's opportunity, lots of opportunities in those price ranges. It, exactly. And I mean, real estate is all about trying to find opportunities where maybe assets are just mispriced or there's a motivation for someone to offload a property. And I mean, we still offer on large institutional apartment complexes, but when you're trying to buy from a, a huge company that's that's got their systems down, very rarely do they need a, a reason to sell. They're just trying to make some cash and sell at the top yeah. of the market. Yeah, trying to sell it. I'm trying to sell it for the most I can get for it. Yeah, exactly. And the next person has to understand how to put value into it because I'm not gonna teach them, right? A hundred percent. Uh, so now with doing the smaller stuff, though, it creates its own set of complications. And I would love for you to talk a little bit about how you get through that. And the first thing I think about is personnel, right? Mm-hmm. How do you show and manage those properties when they're a smaller scale like that? Yeah, we leverage third party property management companies, but even that is never a long term solution. I don't want to offend property managers out there, but at the end of the day, if you don't have equity in a deal, you'll never care as much about an asset as someone who does have equity long term. So we try our best to pick the right partners uh, and we're always consistently testing. There's property managers that we've fired before that uh, we try to get them onto our processes. We try to find compromises 
So that's definitely a hurdle with dealing with smaller uh, asset uh, sizes. But our goal is also we're trying to be hyper focused. We uh, invest out of Cincinnati. We have some specific markets south of Dayton that we like, some specific areas of Columbus that we like. So by building a portfolio, one 30, 40 unit at a time, but in the same zip code, our, our idea is hopefully to have more leverage to to try to get into more institutional level property management. Yeah, no, I totally agree. So listen, we can all say it together, guys. All <laughs> management companies suck, right? They just do, unfortunately. Now, I'm sorry that I'm offending property management companies now, uh, only because I just created my own, right? Oh, wow. So uh, to manage just my stuff, right? Mm-hmm. I've virtually integrated. That's what they call it, right? A virtually integrated. And for the same reason what you just talked about, Jason, is like no one's going to care about your money as much as you do. And third-party management companies are just not built to care. Exactly. They're built to get fees. So what's that movie with, uh, gosh dang it, it's the Wolf of Wall Street, right? Where he goes in and he's talking, he's like, your goal is to get their money and put it into your deal, right? With Matt yeah, yeah. Donahue. I swear to God, that's exactly, you can just say it's not a stock where it's just a property management company. It's like, what? It's Fagazi. <laughs> uh, but I, I feel, sometimes I feel like that's, that is their role is to make sure they get as much as your profit and money that you're working for into their, their coffers. And so, um, but then you bring up a good point though, by scaling, in your area, then you get some compounding effect on the work, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And uh, I mean, my business partner and I, we talk every single week about the potential of starting our own property management company. But I know that's a whole slew of other business problems that that comes with with running that. So uh, at least our short term goal is again, it's all about leverage, right? If you're dealing with a property management company, and you have a 15 unit that you're trying to get them to manage, and they've got a thousand units that they manage, you're, you're a small fish in their pond. And so mm-hmm. even the more units that we can offload to the same property management company, ideally we become a bigger client to them and they treat us a little better. So that that's mm-hmm. short term, long term, potentially trying to bring up personal ourselves, maybe at least as a leasing manager uh, that focuses on a geographic area, but it's a, an evolving conversation, I'll say. Yeah, and for everybody listening, just so you know, like I think we have like 200 and uh, 2,300 beds or units or whatever you want to call it. So we've, I mean, I've been doing this for 10 years now. I just now decided to create my own management company. So it is, uh, and the only reason we're doing this is we have now enough income that we get charged that we can actually hire a full team um, and still have profitability left over. Yeah, exactly. So we have a, an, an assistant, which is a, a place to start. And so we're trying to see what the next most important hire is. Yeah, amen. Amen. So we talked a little earlier, too, about uh, one of your biggest skill sets was underwriting. Uh, yeah, yeah. Just because I came from a data background, uh, I always knew that I was going to be the underwriter, uh, not necessarily because I felt that I had to be stuck to it. But honestly, just because I, I enjoy it so much, I, I love looking at data and analyzing it and uh, piecing together the story behind the scenes. And so the way that I was able to find traction was doubling down on that niche skill set. And uh, obviously, I, I wear a lot of hats today. I'm not just an underwriter. I, I manage the assets. I help with DTS. I uh, find capital for us. So my what I actually do is very widespread, but how I market myself is very specific. And I always say, love to underwrite, love to take a look at deals and and give people an idea if, if this makes sense for them. Yeah, it totally makes sense because, you know, you wear lots of roles, right? Lots of hats. And you have to when, when you're first starting out, you almost wear them all. But yeah. if you're gifted in, in an area, use those strengths. And I think that's exactly what you're saying is like, hey, listen, I was already in data. I already understood this a lot. And so it just it, it made sense that that's easy work for you. For a lot of people like me, I hate putting stuff in spreadsheets. I hate it. Right now, if someone can get it there, then I can only just hit toggle the the buttons that move stuff around. Oh man, I love that. So a lot of times, what what I, I teach is uh, if you're not good at putting the input stuff in, find somebody that is right, mm-hmm. and you'll get way more output out of the deals that you looked at. But what have you found are some of your biggest 
aha moments in your in underwriting that you really have said, oh gosh, I look I make sure I look out for this where I see this a lot. Uh yeah, I have a, a number of tips and tricks that I use for myself that I, I I teach others to use. But one of the things that I always tell people is if you are starting off your underwriting by opening up a spreadsheet, you're you're losing a lot of time. And that comes from direct personal experience too, where I would underwrite a deal for when I first started, it would take me eight to 10 hours to plug all the numbers and really understand what it was. And then I would get really excited because the deal looked amazing. And then I Google the address and I realized it's in Detroit, Michigan. And so I, I try to always think of everything that I do as a process. So even when you're underwriting, making sure that you start off with the big picture of the area and working your way down to the actual property uh, just makes your life so much easier. Exactly. And I think a lot, there's a, a bit of a misconception too, where people think they can hire out underwriting, give it to their nephew, give it to some virtual assistant from India. But I always, uh, from my point of view, as someone who's been in data my entire life, it's always odd to see people willing to trust a complete stranger that might not even have that much skill set into making investment decisions on their behalf that could be millions of dollars. So my philosophy is always that you should have someone that you actually trust be your underwriter, someone that has a little bit of experience. And I think that makes sure that you're mitigating as much risk as possible. Yeah, I, I believe in, uh, I kind of share the same flaw. You have to become a master yourself. If you've not mastered the underwriting process, do not give it to anybody else to do, right? Only when you've mastered something, then you can actually create a training curriculum and send someone and say, listen, and then work with them closely to where they understand how to get the most data into your spreadsheets. Because that's data entry for the most part. Mm -hmm. But it's still got to be accurate because every every p is different, right? Once you get there, then you get that person trained, then you can have more efficiencies. But again, it is a suicide, and I've seen this a lot. When people are like, oh, well, here's my data. And they're like, did you verify any of this? Uh-huh. Well, no. Well, I just did, and it's crap, <laughs> right? <laughs> because I always get people to ask me, look at my deals, right? And I'm like, right, right. Dude, what's going on, right? <laughs> you just wasted 30 minutes of my time. And I think there's also an element of even if someone is good at plugging numbers in and they're accurate, uh, there's always – a lot of room for miscommunication if you and I don't have the same risk tolerance. And if if I'm your underwriter and I think a deal looks fantastic, but it's actually probably too risky for you and your preference, I don't I don't know that off the top of my head. So I might tell you that this deal is good to go. And then you might go through the effort of closing on it and then realize later on that, oh, this is there's there's too much risk for for your personal taste oh yeah you're asking too much yeah so exactly you're yeah and so and just to be clear too i'm not even saying like there's no analysis in what i'm talking about i think data entry is like just get the data in there correct Mm -hmm. that's step one step two is to then say what does this data mean how do we manipulate it where is the uh what's what's the growth for this property what's the business Mm -hmm. plan and that takes uh, a Jason or a Corey, that's where you should be doing your high level work is saying, okay, if you can get the data, the raw data in your, any calculator correctly, then it's understanding what you're gonna do with that raw data. That's the magic, right? That's actually how deals are found. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's it's about understanding the actual business of multifamily. Like you, you can train a parrot to plug numbers in, yep. but yeah, if you don't understand what your business plan should be or the risks involved, you're kind of you're just flying blind. Yeah, you're just flying by and you're going to make mistakes and they're going to cost you a lot of money. You know, it's yeah, funny yeah. in single families, like, oh, you make mistakes and, and it's okay. In multifamily, if you make a big mistake on stuff like that, it can cost you a, a whole lot more. And so you've you really got to be mindful of what goes on because uh, those things do have consequences, right? Especially when you're looking at multi multi million dollar deals. Yeah, that's, yeah, Sammy, same, same, I love that because that's the same exact thing I say. I mean, you're, you're signing sometimes recourse debt for millions of dollars you're taking on investor capital from your mom your grandma your best friend and it's your reputation and it's your money and your friends and families money so i always think that you should you know do your best to, to really understand what you're getting yourself into absolutely one thousand percent cool so 
where do you see, like, where's your future, Jason? And where are you at in this current market cycle? So we acquired, you know, a few hundred units last year. This year, we hope to do the same. We are not uh, necessarily syndicators. Last year, we syndicated a few times, but we also did a bunch of JVs. So we are in a in a place where we're just holding out for really great deals. I mean, even today, we're under contract for a, a 30 unit that will probably close in uh, March or April. And so we are being very selective with the deals that we try to take on just because the, the market's a little uncertain. But that doesn't mean we're also waiting on the sidelines where we're still making offers and numbers that make sense. We are cushioning our underwriting as as much as we feel comfortable with. And we're still trying to pursue a, a lot of the deals that have actually and come when, back on. When you say cushioning, tell me a little, what does that what does that look like? Like what is is it what particular line items do you say, hey, we add more to this? Uh yeah. So making sure that the type of debt is also proper, I'd say would be step one. Uh, we love our local bank connections that give us five to seven year fixed debt, uh, really low uh, interest rates uh, comparatively, uh, 24 months IO. We do love that. Bridge debt is really no longer a uh, a feasible tool for a lot of uh, multifamily syndicators today. 9%, so, 10% money. Yeah, exactly. And I mean, I'm getting like five and a quarter for from local banks, maybe five or under. Uh, and so... Making sure that that you're starting off in the with the, the business plan set the right way, I think, is hyper important. And also making sure that we're not projecting five percent rent growth year over year, where we're keeping it at three, three and a half, four. Uh, every time we think that a full turn is going to cost fifteen thousand, let's cushion that by two thousand a door, just so we have a little bit of extra space. We actually have construction management in house, so we can keep our construction costs very, very low. But even then, we we still buffer it a little bit. If we have uh, passive investors that we have to pay, we make sure that we can at least cover the first year, uh, maybe two years, depending on how much we owe uh, so that we can get distributions out on time. So there's a lot of areas where you can just buffer it. So uh, you make sure that your business plan is sound. And uh, fortunately, that's possible today. I mean, a year ago, we were making offers 20% above asking, promising, 30 day closes with 100K hard EMD. But now that sellers are coming back at the market and there's not enough buyers, we're able to actually cushion it, make our prices a little lower and still get into best and final. So it's, it's, yeah, it's a good beautiful. time to start buying. Yeah. I agree. It's a good time to be started looking at buying and getting the market. Things are already changing. They're already starting to unlock. So there's going to be some deals out there for sure, especially in, in the part where I think it gets hit a little bit on that mama pop section. It doesn't take a whole lot for them to lose faith in what they've got. So if they're, they have a couple of evictions and they're not getting the income, you know, the market's tight, you know, they, they may be willing to let go of stuff a lot cheaper than you would think just because they want to get rid of the headaches or you never know where they're at. Yeah, exactly. And even all the, the, even the, the resources yeah. that bought deals two to three years ago and bridged it, it's, it's getting to a time where they have to make a tough decision on whether their monthly payments double or they also sell. So ideally there's also a little bit of motivation from uh, recent investors too. For sure. Yeah. Well, I've got three bridge notes still that I have to get through. Right. Mm -hmm. And uh, I will. I can't even get out of two of them until August, and because we have an eighteen-month guaranteed minimum interest, mm -hmm. and so in my payment now on these two, I actually had a rate cap, right? So we bought a rate cap, and that thing's paying. Ooh, boy, it's paying. Because <laughs> uh, I think we rate capped it at five point seven, and like the rate right now is like nine point two for right, this right. current for this current bridge. So we're singing like canaries, right? But geez, oh, Louise, if we didn't have that rate cap. I, I'm guessing also when you bought the rate cap, it was affordable. I mean, today people are asking like yeah. $2 million for a, a half a percent rate cap, which is just, it just kills the deal. Yeah. We can sell these rate caps right now for lots of money. Yeah, yeah exactly. But we just want to keep it through the whole cash flow cycle. So we're like, we have another year left on it. So we're like, let's just let it roll. Yeah, and um, so. it'll be fine, right? So, and here's what's great is sometimes you can buy these rate caps outside your loan, which is what we did. And so we actually own the rate cap. So even if I go refi oh, at a better rate at like five, 
I still get the cap paying me every month. Oh, very cool. I didn't realize they could do that. Way, oh yes, way cool, bro. That's like extra <laughs> money. Yeah, yeah, very interesting. Yeah, so super excited about that because in August, I think I still have another like six months left on that rate cap from when I actually refined. Uh-huh. And um, those are just going to be dollars coming, you know, fat dollars coming in, yep. almost $25,000 a month. And so oh, that's, wow. that's huge. Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah. So it's, you don't always plan for these things, but, um, it, but has it been hell? Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. I mean, it has been when you're, even if you have a rate cap, it's just like everything's changed. The whole marketplace has changed a little bit. So I always say for the existing stuff you have right now, it's time to batten the hatches, right? It, Get everything exactly. tight and lean. He, exactly. I mean, even uh, there was a lot of news in early this year where, January and December were the worst leasing months of the last decade. And so it, that's stuff that you just can't plan for, right? Tenants just don't want to move in. And so you have to pay a little bit more for marketing. And this is the time where you're trying to keep occupancy high without necessarily pushing to the top of the market rents. You're not trying to do a ton of renovations to offer beautiful assets to luxury tenants. You're just trying to keep the the ship steady. and Keep your right occupancy, up. keep it high, not create any gaps. Just tighten and batten up the hatches. Exactly. Cool. So, Jason, as we kind of come to the end of this, uh, what does the future look like for you guys? Where do you guys see yourself in the next five years? That's also a continuing conversation. I think we we definitely want to be multifamily investors for a very long time, but we're also exploring different asset classes. I, I look at land and retail commercial in, in New Jersey, where I live. We want to grow our team. We want to not necessarily be a giant company with 20 employees, but at least add more partners, hire some few people, make sure that we are building systems and making the the company a genuine company. And uh, even for the next few years, yeah, we're not really sure. I'm trying to see if I can grow an education arm of my business, maybe make some content to try and see if that could be monetized in some way. So we're, we're exploring options. I think multifamily will always be our core DNA, but making sure we're also branching out and and not just remaining in one place. Cool. Cool. Love it. Love it. Well, listen, is there any books that you've read lately that really have inspired you? That's a great question. I read a book called The Unfair Advantage by, I think the author's name is like Hassan and and Ali, but it's a, a book that explains how different people have different advantages in life. If you are parents are rich, that's an advantage. If you're a great talker, that's an advantage. If you're really smart for whatever reason, that's an advantage. And making sure that you're self-aware enough to understand what advantages you have in life and leveraging them to the best of your ability, which I think really resonates with me. Because I used to always be one of those people that I wish I had more money or I wish I was smarter or I was better at talking. But wishing for stuff doesn't really get you anywhere. And it's more about dealing with reality and playing with the cards that you were dealt. So I, I really like the book. I, I think I finished it maybe like half, half a year ago, but it oh, still wow. resonates with me. Yeah, no, that's great. That's a, I'm going to go check it out. That's awesome. We'll put it in the show notes, guys, if you want to check out that book. So Jason, thanks for that, right? Appreciate that. Of course. And what advice would you give for new people that are starting out, just like you did? Uh, for new people starting out, I, I think the, the piece of advice that I usually tell people that reach out to me is to – uh, double down on the value that you can provide to other people. Multifamily, everyone says it's a team sport. It's 100% true. Unless you're just going to take down quadplexes for the rest of your life, you're going to need partners. You're going to need teams. And if you don't have a concrete value that you add to a team, it's going to be really hard to get your foot in the door. And even the newer investors that reach out to me, all the ones that tell me that they're really scrappy and they're good at everything – they're the ones I don't really know what to do with. I, I can't put you in touch with anyone because you didn't really give me a core value proposition. But if you come to me and you tell me, oh, I'm really good at, I think I can I can raise $250,000. I'm really good at underwriting. I'm really good at asset management. I'm really good at finding deals. Uh, those are the people that I'm like, okay, I can fit you into a niche and then put you with other people that might need that specific skill set. So right. yeah, I always recommend just doubling down. Perfect. Love it. Love it. Love it. Love it. Cool. So if people want to figure out uh, more about you, where do they go out and find you? Uh, I'm pretty active on Facebook and LinkedIn. Uh, Name is Jason Bake, B-A-I-K. 
Uh, if you're interested in learning more about how we do multifamily, uh, compoundingcapitalgroup.com is the multifamily portion of our business. And for any underwriting education, if you're looking to level up your, your own analytical skills, it's the underwritinglab.com. Awesome. Awesome. Well, Jason, I want to t- thank you for taking the time to come on this podcast and sharing a little bit of uh, some of your DNA and, w- and what's made you special. I love the fact that you just went out and did it, right? You just made up your mind and said, I'm, I'm ready and I, it's going to be. Yeah. And, and funny enough, everyone asks me if I you know, regret my decision and my response across the board is not for a single day. It, it's been pretty rough, uh, you know, just being an entrepreneur with absolutely no experience. But uh, this journey has been the most rewarding thing I've ever done in my life. And I, I wake up every single day looking forward to what I do. So I, I can't complain. Right on. Guys, you heard it from Jason. He said it. it's the best thing he's ever done in his life. It is the journey. The journey, guys, is the reward. But the journey starts long before you actually do anything. That journey, my friends, is in your mind. It is the most powerful thing you have. And quite frankly, most of us are not using it to the full potential. Life can give you anything that you want, I promise you. But in order to get it, you have to plant the seed of belief. You have to believe it, guys. If you believe it, you can achieve it. And your paradise is possible.